So how often are the three of you in each other's presence? Houston is a big city, but then there's the Houston rap family, I'll call you. I'd say at least once a month, Yeah. you know, just in general passing. But if there's an event or some hip hop culture based in the city, you'll more than likely see all three of us in the room at the same time. You know, I said Houston rap family. Is that what it is? Is that how you would characterize it? Absolutely. I look to Will as an OG, as an uncle, so to speak. I would say the same. Kiki probably looks up to me in that same regard. And there's many rappers that look up to him in that regard. This is three generations of hip hop. This is first generation, um, 80s into the 90s. This is second generation, 90s into the 2000s. This is third generation, 2000 into the 2010s but the legacy continues on. Yeah. Three different generations, I dare to say three different styles, but you all share this love for the genre. How deep rooted is that love and interconnected with H-Town? Um, I think I would say, I heard him say before, I think, I think we cherish love and respect our music and our culture probably more than any other city. A lot of my game, a lot of my upbringing comes from them three generations. These are a couple of guys that made me even think that I could even make this thing happen. So the admiration that I have for them is probably a little bit more than the more admiration that I have for other artists outside of this area. Mm -hmm. yeah. Willie D, you and the Ghetto Boys are the architects of Houston rap music. And you were able to break through at a time where I felt like East Coast rap and West Coast rap really dominated. What was it about the Ghetto Boys sound that was able to break through? It was H-Town. It was us being the underdogs. For a while, we were consumers. You know, people in Houston were just buying records and we were very supportive of everybody, as long as it was hot, we were on it. And at some point, we was like, we got something to say too. And so we started like chronicling our experiences, our Southern experiences, our, in particular, but Houston, our Houston experiences. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't, we wasn't familiar with subways. We wasn't familiar with gangs and things like that. We didn't do that. So we talked about the things that we do, did know, that we did do, like we know slabs. You know, we, 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 know, uh, we know rap battles. We know how to battle, you know. We know, uh, we, we know style, you know. We, so there's a lot of things that, that's, you know, involved in, in our culture, you know, that we do here that other people don't do. So it's unique to our culture. That's why somebody like a K Reno can go to Finland and sell out a, an arena that has, well, you know, more like a, uh, a venue that has 2,000 people in it. Mm -hmm. And in certain other places, you know, he may not be that well known, but if you go to Finland, K Reno is a big deal. Do you think outsiders, people outside of Houston, obviously they bought into the music literally, right? I mean, platinum is selling albums. Obviously people bought into it, but what do you think was intrinsic in the music that they were able to connect with? Our style, you know, our, our, our lingo, you know, that, that, that Southern raw, you know, that not trying to be like everybody else. Like we embraced, you know, our, our accent. Like we had a chip on our shoulder, like what makes you know, these other guys think that they're better than us just because they're from a different region. Mm -hmm. Like we all know struggle, you know, like struggle is universal. Love is universal. Betrayal is universal. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had these same experiences. It's, it's just that, you know, our experiences were a little, a little bit more um, regional, you know, specific to our region. And so, you know, we, so we spoke to that. And people gravitated toward it because they thought that before, you know, we started putting music out, before Ghetto Boys, they th really thought that we were still riding around on horses and wagons out here. It's serious. I went to St. Louis once after a show, and I was sitting around in a room talking to some girls, and I told them that we actually, when we have a conflict, we have to 
uh, go to the sheriff and get permission for a shootout. And she believed it. <laughs> no, she, she did not. She absolutely believed she <laughs> fell for a hook, line, and sake. And I, and I said, you know, y'all have carpools, we have wagon pools. And she believed it. So, you know, a lot of people get caught up in these uh, depictions of what the South is and what, what, what Houston might be by watching these cowboy western movies and things like that. And then, you know, they come down here and they realize that H-Town is just as uh, cosmopolitan as any other major city. There are streets here. There's hustling <laughs> here. That's all universal. Yeah. Well, all of it, you know, also, you know, like um, intelligence is here. You know, uh, people are, who are educated, a lot of educated people are right here in Houston. Civilized people are in Houston, Texas. And it's sad to say, but it's people that, have, that are not well-traveled. They just know their block, they know their city, and they think the world revolves around that. And it doesn't, you know. There are people who really are very limited in their cultural experiences uh, because they haven't moved around. Luckily for us, you know, all three of us, uh, we've been able to uh, express ourselves and, 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 and basically, you know, represent our city and be able to travel and spread the word that, you know, H-Town got something to say. You know, the South got something to say. A lot yeah. to say. Yeah. yeah. How do you think your lyricism and your talent influenced up and coming rappers? They saw it was possible. This is simple. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't go in thinking like, oh man, we're gonna change the world. It wasn't like that. We was just like, man, we're gonna go get some respect for the H-Town, you know? Like, we're gonna go get some respect. We want them to know that we got something to say. We here, we exist. We're not just consumers, we got talent too. So for us, it was like, we, I don't know how cognizant we were of opening the door for future rappers. It was just like, we're gonna just let these people know that we have something to say, that we are here. And you know, the people in this town, in this city matters. People in the South matters. Like we all, we're not just a bunch of country bumpkins, you know, like the same thing that goes on in these other cities, much of the same thing that goes on in these other cities go on in the South also. And so everybody, you know, everybody, and everybody here is that, that are not black, you know, that are white, it's not like on some KKK st type stuff either. You know, like some people, they think of the South and they think, oh, Texas, oh man, Mr. Hot Wheels, gonna, they gonna come for me. Like, nah, it's not like that. It's not like that for everybody. You know, some people have that type of attitude, but you know, uh, a lot of what you, what you get is the energy that you put out. Yeah. It gave a portrait of what Houston was, who was Houston. And when I say Houston, I mean a greater extension, of course, talking about the South and going all the way to Port Arthur, Texas and to Beaumont and so many of those artists who came from those areas and then came here to Houston and really just bought into that sound and growing it. Well, there you know, we had all, not to cut you off, man, but we had all been fans of the culture. We had all actively been buying music, listening to music, some of us, were you know practicing DJs and MCs and in our bedrooms and in our schoolyards and whatnot. But once Rap a Lot Records, which was based in Houston, started to release music with artists that were from Houston, who talked the way people in your neighborhood talk, who talked about streets that you'd driven down before, right? Talked about neighborhoods and parks that you were familiar with. Then it started to hit different. You started to see that people were not just actively participating in the culture but they were now contributing to the culture. And if this person from that side of town that grew up on that street could do it, why can't I do it? Why can't I be a part of it and be in a position to contribute as well? So seeing an example of someone from where you're from actively doing what it is you aspire to do really changes the way you even frame an entry point into these type of opportunities and experiences. You know, if I hadn't seeing Willie D actually releasing music and seeing people around the country respond to it and receive it, I may not have had that confidence so early 
in me being an artist to even give it a shot. But seeing that somebody else could do it from where we were from made us be like, oh yeah, we could do it too. We just got to make sure we make a music that's up to par like they are. Yeah. I know we talked about three different generations and three different sounds. There really was, I, I feel like, a shift in lyrics and style that really embraced Houston's pastime. And Kiki, you mentioned it, the, the slab culture, right? Talk to us about the slab culture and how that gave so much to present musically to an audience in the ears. Well, I would say um, the slab culture is very important to what we do because we idolize those street stars before we was able to idolize real rap stars. Like being from Houston and being from Texas, I, I value these particular rappers and these particular street stars before I could even think that I was gonna be popular in New York or anything like that. So the slab is something that I deeply rooted into my game because I was raised by these particular people. And these are the people that showed me the pictures and the portraits of the ghetto that I wanted to talk about. So when I done my first album, I named it Don't Mess With Texas because Texas was the most important thing to me after Houston. After Houston, I mean, after the neighborhood and the screw tapes and then the city, the next most important thing to me was Texas, not how the people felt outside of it, not how the people felt in California. If I could get the approval from the ghetto boys, from UGK, from DJ Screw, to be one of these people to represent the city, that was much, much more important. So my whole game was about the slab and what we do and all that because these were the most important things. I wasn't from the subways and the the Timberlands and the boots, so I didn't know how to explain it to you. All I knew was visions and portraits of cars and elbows and trunks and red and all that, so that was all I was able to explain to you. And sticking to that, I believe, is why I'm still able to be relevant to today because these people that I built my career off through that, these are real. That's another thing about Houston and our Texas and our culture. We have real, true, powerful fans that stick through. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why our OGs and our people, we still book to the limit and we still doing the Texas because our fans are still from a buying culture of supporting what we do. And the slab is a big part of that. It's timeless mm -hmm. music. And I want to talk more about that. But real quick, I want to educate people in case they're watching and they're like, what's, what's a slab? So we're gonna do a, 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 we're gonna do a quick dictionary here. Okay, first up, slab. If someone can quickly define it, whoever's First of all, the slab is not a car. The slab is the concrete. It was, it was, we were supposed to hold slab. You were supposed to come down slab. We're gonna wreck the slab. You're gonna hurt the slab. As this particular term grew into the youngsters, now, I'm, I'm victim of both because if I'm explaining to the youngsters, I will call a car a slab. But if I'm talking in OG terms and we're talking in terms of you need to get the history of it, the slab is not a car. It's the concrete. It's Martin Luther King. It's, it's, it's Doosan Park. It's wherever you're going to. It's the Capitol Beach Party. It's the slab. We want a whole slab. Now, as time progressed, now you're talking about bumper kits and grills and elbows and all that. And that's a slab, too, for the people who represent it in today's terms. Mm -hmm. Swingers, you said that somewhere in there. What's 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 a swinger? <laughs> I swear, what you call it? Here you say it again. <laughs> <laughs> See exactly, exactly. This is a self education as well too. It's called a swinger. Okay. And it don't, it's not a swinger. It's a swinger, and it needs to be said in that particular thing. Now it's come from a wheel that was come from created from a wheel called Crager. This wheel was produced in '83 and '84. And uh, they even had some in 85, you know what I'm saying? But those, those don't fly, you know what I'm saying, as much as the ones. And that's a particular wheel that came on a Cadillac that became very popular in our culture. And later on, it was reproduced by the Texan Wine Wheel or whatever they do. But uh, 83 and 84 is a classic wheel, and that represents the swing. 83, 84, glass, swing, it's all the same thing. Elbows. That, same. Same room. Same thing. Deuce and a quarter. That's a car. <laughs> yeah. L dog. That's a car. That's a car. <laughs> and uh, finally, four fours. That's that's <laughs> that's the rim. It depends. It depends well. on what we talk about the dog. But now the four fours is four <laughs> of the foes. That's four eighty foes. Tipping you, on four foes. But you could also come from the four four. 
Which, which is Acres Homes, right? Acres which homes. is Acres right. Homes. Right. Because yeah. usually they saying you're riding on four folks because you can't be riding on five. Pretending, with, <laughs> depending on where you at, you might be on six. <laughs> so these terms work together. Seven. You could be holding the slab <laughs> in a slab, riding on four foes in the, the fo -fo. Fo -fo. You could put all that together and you would not be having any double negatives. In with it. your elbows out on your riding elbows. Both. Ah, yeah, I follow you. You got I it? I follow yeah. you. I do. All right. And I know a lot yeah. of this is intertwined within the music. Uh, tipping on four fours is 20 years old. That's crazy. Is it? Wow. It is. That's crazy. It wow. Is. And I sick. still hear it all the time yeah. in so many different places. You still hear this 20 year old song from sports arenas to Texans games to parties to on the block. That's a testament to our culture. That's what we explaining that there is no other culture that's going to continue to be the driving force of making these songs. Listen, we could throw a party right here and we don't have to leave. We think we we think we really doing it, you know what I'm saying? Because we got that much support of our city and you know that makes us be able to have these timeless and classic songs like that. You know, for many years being a fan of hip hop in Houston, <laughs> you could only support people outside of Houston because that was the only place music came from. Once the hip hop started to actually be created here and people could actually speak to the identity of Houston and fans of hip hop music could support people directly representing their culture, they took it far more serious than maybe cities like New York and LA where the culture was much more available to them and was always more accessible to them. Once Houston had people whose music represented the ID, the identity and the idea of how they saw the city. Mm -hmm. That's when they latched on and never let go. The way that everyone that walks and lives in the city of Houston and goes about their day cares about the city of Houston, the music we created is their soundtrack. It says how they feel and they still feel like that. People that love Houston love Houston. Mm -hmm. And so music that talks about love in Houston will never be separated from the culture. Yeah. I don't care how long I'm gone after this music, there are still gonna be people that wake up every day that want to show how much they love Houston and it's very easy for them to do by playing songs. Mm -hmm. Songs that then turn into anthems like Southside. Again, another track that's now decades old. Um, I think, um, <laughs> are you decades old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah, that's what, I'm that's to, what I was wondering. I, to, I said I that and I thought, hmm. <laughs> now, but I would tell people, I tell people all the time, I don't know if it's from a social media standpoint based on how it's going now because you can get more access to it. You know, your telephone, the streaming, and it's big, it's bigger than, it's much bigger than it was 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I think I own it now, so it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the rights have reverted. It's much bigger now, but yes. yeah, I, I love those songs, and um, it was times where, and we, like we said, we made those songs. We didn't, we didn't go in the studio and make these songs for the world. We made them mm -hmm. for the city and for the town, and you know what I'm saying. And people was on us about that at the time. Man, you're just making this song, but now it's twenty some years later, and I've been asked to redo that song five times. I, I can't get it done. It don't work. It's, that's it. That's it. That's the one it is, and that's what it's going to be. Oh, it works. Yeah, yeah. Me trying to do it again. <laughs> no, it don't work. But um, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times when people uh, have a knock about you, uh, any of us making music that's specific to our region, uh, that comes from arrogance because nobody had anything to say when, you know, NWA made the song about uh, Gangsta Gangsta. They, nobody had anything to say when. Uh, Grandmaster uh, Flash and uh, Furious Five made the song about the message. You know, all that, that was all New York. It was all about New York culture. And nobody, and nobody questioned it. And that's why at the end of the day, you know, good music is good music. If you just put it in pocket, you got a good beat, you know, you got good words, you got a nice hook, you know, and you're saying something substantive, like, you know, uh, people, people will respond and they'll reward you for it. It seems like Houston artists, Houston rap artists, love to collaborate. Almost seems like more than any of these other meccas for rap music. The Third Coast has no problem collaborating and doing songs together, am I right? No, no, because we all actually genuinely like each other. You know, we see each other, you know, very often. I go to a lot of cities. LA rappers don't necessarily see each other because there's a lot of different street structure 
um, that divides that city. New York people, um, artists don't typically see each other in great numbers because of that divide as well. But Houston is the biggest small city in America. We typically, well, you, Houston is the only city where you will probably see some of the most famous artists or celebrities in your city in the grocery store at a restaurant. Like you don't see, you'll never see somebody in New York shopping at a grocery store or anything like that. We're at one with the city. We don't feel separated like that from the people of Houston. We all look at ourselves as Houstonians because we share so many common bonds. When the Texans are winning, I'm just as excited as any other fan. When the Astros go to the World Series, I'm just as excited as any other fan. I don't go as an artist, I go as a fan. If people choose to look at me as that, then so be it. But when somebody hit a home run, we all high five it, you know what I'm saying? There's a different level of unity that this city provides to us as entertainers that other cities just can't afford to the people that represent them. And we don't take that for granted. So we constantly, constantly give back to the city and they reciprocate. So the bond never, it's not about the bond breaking. It's a cycle that we're constantly tied in with this city. You can't separate us from it no more. And the city wants us to be the soundtrack to victory, to success, to progress, to diversity, to, you know, to the growth of the city of Houston. They want us to be the soundtrack to that. Fans love the love among Houston's rap community, I think, too. Because they see us together all the time. Somebody drops an album, we had the release party, somebody shoot a video, we in the background, you know, somebody make a video about a car, they gonna call Paul. Paul gonna pull up in his car, they gonna call Key. Key gonna pull up in his car. They, this is how things are done. Yeah, we, we, we actually socialize with each other in this city, and we don't have to be doing music together to see each other to chill together. If I go to Astros game, I know I'm gonna see him. You know what I'm saying? We going to football, I know I'm gonna see him. You already anticipate these things. Hey, you going, what jersey you wearing? I don't want to wear this. You know what I'm saying? We socialize, like, legitimately. It does not have to be for promotion, for marketing, for branding, or anything. But if we need each other for that, we're always available to each other. I think we blessed in that particular area, and we see favor in that. And I was just telling somebody that the other day, a lot of this camaraderie that we got, and you see us together, we've been through all the storms for the city, though. We lost all the deals. We had the, the <laughs> criticism, the ridicule, and such, such. And now it's 20, 30 years later, we're getting to go to the Texan game, and we're getting to perform at the rodeo. These is favor ain't fair, the accolades and the work that we put in for all these years. So a lot of youngsters see us sometimes, and they be like, man, they getting all, now we're not getting all the fruits. We're getting all the, <laughs> everything, all the work that we put in and all the time that we, I've been representing this city and getting told no and kicked down and saying it ain't it for much, much longer than you've been outside saying that you represent it. So some of the favor and stuff that we getting in the, we, it's so easy to, for me to want to do a song with Bun or Beat King or DJ Toes and, and, instead of wanting to do it with somebody out of town because I really get to see this person and me genuinely ask him and getting it, it's, it really means something to me. Mm -hmm. so, you know, the, yeah. the love that we, that we get also is, is a, uh, a testament to the commitment that a lot of the people who work behind the scenes for these organizations, Bun mentioned the Astros and the Texans, you know, these guys who work in these organizations, they reach out to us and they invite us into their home uh, when they have games, you know. So they make us feel like, that we're a part of the organization. And so it's easy when, when, when the organization reaches out to you and they say, we want you to be a part of this, we respect what you do, we want uh, you, you know, we want you guys to, to, to represent. And, you know, when they do that, uh, it just makes it a whole lot easier for us to, to be, get involved. Uh, we don't see that in a lot of other cities. You know, we, we, we're watching just like everybody else, just like, just like the other fans are watching. We're watching the television too, and we don't see a lot of, uh, a lot of the, uh, the local artists at, at, these, at these games and in the, in, in the sky boxes and stuff like that. And um, I don't know what the reason is behind it, but they just don't have that connection that we have, mm -hmm. you know, with our, with our people that run the organizations here. It's a deep-rooted connection. Yeah, and, and, to, and to the point that Kiki made about weathering these storms, you know, we, we literally weathered the storm, like literally weathered the storms. When they come in, we're on the ground. We're boots on the ground, just like uh, first responders. Our rappers, our heroes right here, we're on the ground. We're actually helping out. We're, 
we're giving our name and our, and our, and our likeness and our bodies to helping to deliver uh, you know, goods and, and supplies for, for people who are in dire need. We're out there, we're on the ground for real. So it's, it's just a, it's a total different vibe than, than you'll see anywhere else you go. Mm -hmm. a total different vibe, a total different sound. I wanna go back to sound and talked about chopped and screwed because that is uniquely Houston and this area. Uh, chopped and screwed very different than what anyone had heard before and still resonates today. Chopped and screwed, give us your definition of it, Kiki. Um, <laughs> well, the thing about it is, it was a time where, in my younger life, where it, I had become so consumed with it that I didn't hear nothing else. Everything else that I, everything that I really basically heard knew, it was chopped and screwed. My first big song is from a chopped and screwed album on his beat on on Pocket Full of Stone. So we had got so wrapped up into it. So the thing about it, when it first started, we were all a little bit confused about it. You know what I'm saying? As far as you know, hearing it, what it's doing, the double. But as time, you know, as time progressed with it, we started to get more and more used to it, and it just took off. It took off bigger than we ever thought it would be. And my thing is, yeah, it's, st it's still strange to some people. It's still some people who don't know actually what it is, because now it's much more than a sound. It's it's a it's it's, it's down in its own genre. It's uh, it's it's its own particular thing that's in the south that needs to be praised on its own. Because now you can do a regular tape and that. I don't do as much as I used to do, but the sound chopped and slow. I think it took much more legs than just being something that was done. It was something that was a part of our culture, a part of our music, a part of our lifestyle, how we do it, radios, cars, it's people, I know people right now who still have a transition out of that music. Like I got friends right now, they still just straight listen to straight chop the screw. They don't even listen. And I'm the opposite now, you know what I'm saying? I kind of listen to nothing but regular music now. You know what I'm saying? So I think that Chopped and Screwed is not just something that y'all heard with the double beat and all that DJ Screw. We got a lot of definitions of that. I think it's now a part of our culture and something that has to be talked about when you talk about our music, period. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the mm -hmm. Houston music Houston. legacy. Yes. And music legacy in general. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because I think that's the thing. And uh, Willie, you touched on this earlier about Houston music now having this broad appeal and being international, right? And I know obviously with UGK and with Big Pimpin', I mean, you guys were already superstars, but that really, really, I felt like catapulted that name UGK to a whole new stratosphere. No, absolutely, well. because I, th I, think, I think the one thing that I've noticed with Southern music, as opposed to music from other regions, is that we make this shit look fun. Like, we really are actually having a genuinely good time. We're not necessarily worried about if our clothes gonna get wrinkled through the video shoot and stuff like that. We take pride in our appearance, but we're not stuck on it like that. We try to have a good time and show the energy and the vibe of it. That's why a lot of music today carries different elements of Houston hip hop in it in order to make themselves look a little bit cooler. You know what I'm saying? In the moment, a lot of what we've done in Houston lifestyle, which translated into the, truth, the Houston music culture is now popular culture. You know what I'm saying? There are artists who are not from Houston who don't necessarily have a fan base within the Chopped and Screwed um, audience who will still make a Chopped and Screwed or a slowed down version of their album just to make sure they're making it more palatable for people in this region. Yeah, that's, you know, that, that's what I was thinking. Right the there. South is the largest musical region in the country. If it's just a numbers game, we have always been the biggest supporters and the biggest buyers of, of music. Houston was typically number one for buying music in general. So once we decided to stop just buying music and start making music, well, we didn't have to buy music from other places. And then once DJ Screw created something that separated us from everything else that was being done musically anywhere else, now we have this signature sound that we can attach to the lifestyle and the culture. And so you see people wanting to be a part of that stuff. They come to Houston, they want to do a song with a Houston rap, 
hey man, can we get some slabs? You know what I'm saying? That's the first thing people say. Can y'all bring the slabs out? And Kiki got to explain the slab ain't a car, the slab is a slab. <laughs> but, but I'm saying that it's just, it's impossible now to show that you're getting money, representing your hood and having a good time doing it without either collaborating with a Houston artist, making a remix of a Houston record, or trying to bring in elements that represent Houston's culture. We're inseparable from hip hop, from people having fun and making money in hip hop now. They all come from the South primarily. People that all the biggest records in hip hop now have a lot of Southern um, culture in the music and Southern sound in it. And that's predominantly the Houston sound. Mm -hmm. It's Grammy season. And I have to ask, with all this talk about music, what are three rap icons like yourself listening to? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, right now, oh, yeah. obviously, the big dogs in the game, uh, you know, obviously, the Drake album was amazing this year. But also, the Killer Mike album um, was, Michael, was an extremely well-produced and well-written and executed album. Um, but that being said, I'm not just into hip hop. I'm a big fan of Jelly Roll. Jelly Roll comes from hip hop culture out of Tennessee. You know, I, I knew him for many years being associated with Haystack and different artists representing Tennessee. And now he's out here with his own signature sound, but looking like a rapper, acting like a rapper, <laughs> moving like a rapper, but it's just country music and these beautiful vocals coming out. You know what I'm saying? He's just as much a part of hip hop as he is a part of, of country culture, which is something that you start to see a lot more because we come from this Southern lifestyle and this cowboy aesthetic is a huge part of Southern identity. And so I'm excited not just to see rappers that are excelling in rap, but rappers that are transcending into other spaces as well. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, I'm actually kind of listening to me. I'm working on an app. <laughs> oh, yeah. I am. I, yeah. I like I be, that. I'm listening to so you, you too, listening though. To I'm, me. Just, you, I'm working on this album, so I'm listening to it over and over and over, you know, really wearing myself out, overthinking, you know what I'm saying? But I'm listening to me, but I'm an R&B guy, too. I'm kind of always dipping over there a little bit. And then when I get over there, I got younger kids. My kids young, so they have me on the the Gunners and all that. I'm on all that. I'm on a little bit of the youngsters, and then I do a little R&B, then I do me. So I'm a little, I'm a little mixture of it. Yeah. My kids, when they get in the car, they, they Bluetooth automatically. They don't want me touching the radio. I can't control nothing. You know, they take complete over. So I'm forced into some of this, you know, what's happening. I'm on a little Meek Mill and Rick Ross, too. And you find yourself yeah, jamming it, though, I take yeah. it, right? Yeah, yeah, I love what it. the kids are listening yeah, to. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, actually. yeah. Um, is the new album, new music, is it going to stay true to you? Or are you sampling and experimenting? I do a little. I try to. I, my goal with each album is to make sure that my fans are excited about listening to me again. So when I do this music, I try to make sure I put an effort into it and put into a little bit. I try to mix it up a little bit. It ain't just all old Kiki. That's how I'm able to still have an opportunity to do it now. So I kind of mix it up. I kind of make sure I stay true to myself so my fans excited. And then I go out the box a little bit. I done had songs with Toby, Meat Bun. We might, I might do something a little different each time. but. The goal is to make sure when I say I'm doing another album at this particular stage in my career, that my fans are just excited about hearing about it as the last one. That's the goal. Willie D, what are you listening to? Prince. <laughs> Prince. <laughs> yeah. Prince, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder. Classics. <clears throat> Sam Cooke. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, I like uh, Police. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And nostalgic like sound. Yeah, you know, like I, I just, you know, I don't really want to sound like an old head, but <laughs> that music was just so good. Yeah. The writers were so good. Mm -hmm. The R&B was so wholesome. Mm -hmm. You know, it was good stuff, you know, like had some suggestiveness about it. You know, it was not Not like so blunt. So blunt <laughs> and raw. You know, I'm cool with blunt rap. You are? Mm -hmm. But I don't like, yeah, I'm kind of cool. Dude. <laughs> but, I, you know, but I, I, I want my R&B to be a little bit more sensual, you know? Okay. And so I, I like what those artists did, what those heroes, those musical heroes did, you know, back in the gap. I really appreciate the, you know, the George Clintons, who, who by the way, congratulations, just got his star on the Walk of Fame. Wow. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Well deserved. Yeah. Absolutely. Well deserved. That's great. Great. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, since we are surrounded by albums, anyone listen to vinyl at home in your downtime? Maybe at the studio, I don't know. Uh, I have the vinyl player. Uh, somebody bought it for me. Yeah. And every once in a while, I try to make sure, but I'm not tapped in. That telephone is poison. You know, it's just, it's right there. It's, yeah, so that's it. But the vinyl, I think, um, I try to always make sure that I keep something. Because I always try to explain to my kids, I'm from all all areas of the game. Vinyl, cassette, CD, streaming, what else y'all got? An NFT or something falling down. Whatever you got, <laughs> I'm dying with it. Non-fungible token <laughs> you know music, I love I'm it. I'm dying with it. So I don't get to listen to it as much as I, I need to, but it's still a part of my game, though. I dabbled in it during COVID, started running out of things to do, sitting in the house all day, and we had a record player, we had some records, so we just started playing it, and then that turned into doing little small DJ sets on on Instagram, just to, you know, just to stay sane, I think, in the moment, just, you know, not get get down and stuck in a rut, you know what I'm saying, with, with the uncertainty of what the future was going to bring back then. Uh, but I'm by, no, I'm by no means a DJ. Like, I can't get in the booth. And, and do it like that. They have one here. <laughs> most of the most of the vinyl I have now are like collectors items. Yeah. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Part of like the merch package. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I'll end with this. And now I feel better, Kiki, because I was like, I don't know, is Kiki old enough to have owned an album? <laughs> uh, tell me and uh, so tell me each if you can remember the first album that you bought. Oh man, that's oh. good. The first record I bought was Ring My Bell. When I was a kid, I didn't really know what that meant at the time. Um, <laughs> my first. But my you were running around singing it, yeah, weren't you? Ring my, and, and I bought it, in my, but my brother would play it all the time. And my brother was gay, and I didn't understand that Ring My Bell was kind of like a little anthem or whatever. And I'm just sitting around that. It just was good music to me. But obviously, it, it meant two oh. things, two different things to two different people in the room. But the first album, like the first money I ever spent on the album was The Adventures of Slick Rick. Okay. I got that for Christmas. My mom uh, gave me $20 and took me to Ted's record show shop in Port Arthur. And I bought it. And I, she was like, let me hear, let me hear the music. And the first song on that album is called Treat Him Like a Prostitute. And so um, it didn't go over well with her, with that being the first rap song she ever heard. And then when I started trying to do music and she asked me to hear my music, the first song is Cocaine in the Back of the Ride. And the first words on that is Pimp C. So what the F is up? And again, it was not a good, it did not go over well with my very Christian mother. My, my first record, my first re I, I haven't, I don't think I ever got a record, mm -hmm. but the first record that I kind of was a part of, my sister had a record. She had Thriller, you know yes. what I'm saying? With the open it up with Michael Jackson with the white on. Uh, and listen, I used to stand it, I couldn't touch it. You know, she's six, seven years older than me. I can't touch it, I can't, but I used to be able to look at it and it's on the wall. And this was when the first post was on the wall. So that's the first actual vinyl that I seen in my house, you know what I'm saying? It was Thriller with Michael Jackson on it. That's probably the only one I ever had. I ain't get, I didn't even really get my own vinyl until I redid Don't Mess With Texas when I got older. I ain't, by the time I got the rolling with music, the cassettes was rolling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Music had moved on. All right, Willie D, your first album. Stevie Wonder. Inner Visions. Still jamming that now. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Stevie Wonder. And, and, and let me put this to rest right now. I've been hearing a lot of people talk about who the greatest artist is of all time and all this kind of stuff. And heard a number of people say certain names. I ain't going to repeat them. But let me just put this to bed. And for anybody that's on the fence, y'all can just join my side if you want to. Um, Stevie Wonder. I mean, besides Willie D, Stevie Wonder is the greatest <laughs> artist of all time. Everything that your favorite artist did, Stevie Wonder did without sight. Now, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Okay. He was rapping on some of those tracks. Yeah, Stevie Wonder, ain't nobody touching Stevie Wonder. <laughs> except, Point, except Willie blank, D. Period. Except, except Willie, Willie D. D. <laughs> just, just, just to be clear. clear. Look, I just know, want to be clear about yeah, that just, before I go out. And just to be I clear. Forgot, you know, my mom used to have a few records too. Luther's and all, Freddie Jackson. Oh, yes, that. yes, yes. Yeah. Al Green. There's a lot of blues in my house. Bobby uh, Blue Bland, ZZ Hill. Oh. Tyrone Davis, yeah. records like that. Yeah, see, that was my mom too, you know. like So my mom played blues and R&B in her house, and my dad played soft rock. Okay. So I kind of got, got it from both angles. 
a nice mix. Yeah, it was a good mix. Very. So that's where the police come in. Yeah, that's where the police okay. come in. That one threw you off. Huh? He was going I, down a list I, and then suddenly said the, police. The police or the <laughs> police? police. I, I, I know about police. I didn't know where he was going with this. Not the police. Police. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes I was I had interactions with the police while listening to the police. Okay, right, <laughs> yeah. But tell it worked. Next time, out. tell the police they need to listen to more police. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs>